Let me welcome you to the, uh, the session on the Sustainable Investing Challenge. And uh, before we launch right into it, uh, maybe just a little bit of background. My name's Dave Chen. Uh, I'm the chairman of Equilibrium Capital Group, and uh, I'm also uh, adjunct uh, professor of finance at, at Kellogg. About eight years ago, we, we, we began to notice at, uh, at the schools, leading schools around the United States and around the world, that the issue of uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable finance, and impact investing were becoming uh, very, very popular topics of discussions. And it really started with a, a lot of the, uh, the clubs at the, at the schools. And we started noticing that students were really engaged in almost all matters of microfinance, social enterprise, uh, the emergence of the uh, carbon cap and trade and that interest in wanting to not just have it as a, as a club interest, but, but also beginning to think about this as potential careers. We started noticing, as I said, this happening a, a across uh, multiple business schools, multiple programs. And, and we started asking the idea of, of whether we could more directly uh, engage students in using their business school education, their finance uh, curriculum and degrees to uh, address and use capital markets to address the issues of market failures, uh, issues of, of, of societal problems, issues of environmental problems. Sort of uh, said simply, uh, can we use the implements that, uh, that we learn for collateralized debt obligations, securitization, fund management, capital markets, and can we use them to direct them at things like water, energy, poverty, et cetera? We wanted to, in, in effect, see if we couldn't catalyze the next generation of investment professionals that were grounded in the fundamentals of their education, but were applying that creativity and innovation into, into solving these kinds of problems. So about seven years ago, uh, more, we uh, at Kellogg uh, uh, got together a bunch of schools and created the Sustainable Investment Challenge, which is today known as the Kellogg Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investment Challenge. It now covers uh, as many as 60 grad schools from around the world that now participate. And literally in our seven years, I think we've touched thousands of grad students uh, literally around the world uh, that, are, that are competing with their best and brightest ideas. Uh, this last month uh, in New York, uh, we had, uh, as we always do, brought 10 teams together, uh, again, from around the world. And, uh, and here today, what we're doing is showcasing, as an example of that, uh, the winner of this year's SIC. And uh, so I'm very proud to, uh, to, uh, to introduce Ashwin, Chris, and Erica, who were representatives of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the winning team, Edu India Fund. Uh, the way this panel will go is that uh, we'll ask them to actually literally give you the presentation that they presented uh, in front of an august series of uh, investment professionals. And, uh, and then I'll invite you to ask questions about their idea. And then I'll try to pose a few questions later to catalyze this and maybe raise it up uh, beyond this idea to the broader topic of, of, of engaging our next generation of business students, how business education is changing, et cetera. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ash and uh, let you start. Uh, and before you do that, maybe just to, uh, I'm going to ask each of you just to briefly introduce yourselves and, and, and talk a little bit about what got you here. Sure. Got it. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for coming. And thanks a lot to Milken for having us present and share our idea here. We're really looking forward to all of your questions and all of your feedback on this idea. So a bit about myself. I'm currently a first year student at the Kellogg School of Management. I'm originally from Singapore, and before this, I was at BCG in Singapore for three years. Before that, I did my undergraduate in chemical engineering, and I had a startup selling a special kind of ruler to high school kids in Singapore. I'm very passionate about education. I don't actually have the experience that Erica and Chris have in the education space, but I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to get involved. So once again, thank you for having us. I'm Chris Shaw. I'm a second year at Kellogg. Uh, I started my career in corporate development um, and helped launch a corporate VC arm. And by doing that, got involved in the startup scene. And so, you know, hopped across a number of tech startups and landed in one of my own, um, which is an education technology startup. Yeah, cool. Erica, uh, I'm originally from Brazil. 
I mean, this, uh, I mean, they won my program at Kellogg. Uh, my f I started my career in the financial markets in private banking, and then I started my own business. It's an educational technology startup uh, that I have in Brazil, and I'm a, I'm passionate about education as well. Happy to be here. Hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay, cool. I guess we can start. All right. So we are working to improve access to quality education in India. And we're doing this by providing expansion capital to low-fee private schools. Our first fund, called Edu India Fund 1, is meant to be a pilot. This is an $11 million 10-year private debt fund that is going to give expansion capital to 1,000 schools in Uttar Pradesh in India. We're expecting returns of 7% real terms back to our investors, which is in line with long-term debt benchmarks in India. Before I go on, let me just talk a bit about the education landscape in India. There are 1.5 million K-12 schools all across India. 400,000 of them are a special kind of school called low-fee private schools. For a small amount of seven US dollars per month, your child can get a better quality education and broader content coverage than they can at the free government institutions. This model has proved very popular because 182 million students are currently enrolled in such schools. That's 40% of the K-12 population. But still, for every 100 kids that are in these classrooms, these schools have to turn 50 kids away because there's no space. There is excess demand for these schools, but they're not able to meet it. One of the main reasons is that most of these schools lack access to expansion capital. They can't get loans to build new classrooms and grow the number of students that they have. Now, the tier one schools, the largest and the most expensive of these schools, do have some form of access. They can get term loans from specialized lenders, ISFC and Vardhana. These tend to be three to seven year term loans with an interest rate of 20 to 25 percent. But tier two and below, they have no access whatsoever. We believe that we can serve the second and the third tiers of these schools. That represents a market of 3.1 billion US dollars in terms of debt demand. Now, in order to serve them, we need to better appreciate why the term loan model that served the tier one schools is not appropriate for them. There's two main things. These tier two schools have low margins because they are subscale. Now, if you try to apply a term loan model to these schools, what ends up happening is that for the initial couple of years, the fixed interest payments and the fixed loan repayments become too much. After year three, after the expansion is complete and the new classrooms have come in, that cash flow available for debt service, which is the yellow line over there, does become enough to cover the interest payments. But before that, the first couple of years are still an issue. The second thing is that these tier two schools serve parents whose incomes tend to be more volatile. Think the day laborer who gets daily or weekly wages. Dips in parent incomes have a direct impact on school revenues through dropouts and empty seats. And this has a direct impact on whether or not the school is able to make a loan repayment, and this increases the risk of default. Our mechanisms, we believe, can get around these two issues. First of all, we offer deferred demand dividend payment schemes, which are based on a percentage of revenue. This better suits the, the school's cash flow available for debt service because these payments will start only after year three, after the expansion has actually come in. Further, if the school has impacted revenues for any reason, for example, having high dropouts, the payments to us also reduce, so that reduces the risk of default. The second thing is that we offer tuition insurance in the form of student loans that are um, in the form of student loans that are provided by our MFI partners. So here, if parents are unable to make a payment for any reason, they can approach the MFI partner, get a loan for three months or six months, and keep their kid in school. This stabilizes the school's revenues because that kid can stay on after the three months or after the six months and this further reduces the risk of default. Let me pass it on to Chris to talk a bit more about how these innovations fit within our business model. Great. So the crux of our model is really a simple school expansion loan with a demand dividend twist. Uh, we'll put up $17,000 in rupees, and the school will put up the remaining $1,700 um, in order to complete the project. 
Uh, and year three, once expansion is complete, we begin to take monthly payments at 14% of revenue. And we calculate that very simply. How many students do you have? What do you charge for tuition? We take 14% of that. Now, because this is based on revenue, we are naturally inflation hedged. And so this is a benefit that we get to pass on to our investors in monthly dividends. And because of this natural hedge, you'll hear us talk a lot about real returns throughout this presentation, which are about 7% net of fees, which is 13.5% nominal. Now, what makes this work is the tuition insurance mechanism. When a parent can't make a payment, the MFI underwrites a loan for three to six months of tuition at 15% interest, which is still 40% discount on the other retail lending options out there. The MFI makes these payments to the school directly and then collects on them from the parents after the forbearance period is over. Now, because these loans are so small and the risk of default is so high for the MFI, the deal needs to be pretty sweet for them to stick around and work with us. And so we do that in a couple of ways. The first one is that the MFI is only responsible for 25% of tuition. Now, schools will go for this because 25% is better than zero. Despite the excess demand in the system, because of the lumpiness in enrollment, it's actually hard to fill a seat midway through the year. So the 25% covers the cost of serving that student, and then they get to keep that student in the classroom and continue to collect revenue after the loan period is over. The second thing we do is that while they're collecting 100% of tuition from the parents, we then also guarantee the capital out, the original 25% outlay. All in, this is a 220% return to the MFI. And to further sweeten the deal and to simplify our operations, uh, all of our contracts for auditing and collections are with the same partner. Now, this tuition mechanism costs us a premium of about 0.4% on our returns and uh, levers up 2.3% on our IRR. Now, obviously, a model like this has a couple of risks. Um, the ones that are, we are most sensitive to are diligence costs, defaults, and delays. And that's why we're developing, similarly to how Varthana and ISFC have a specialized, standardized due diligence process, we're developing our own that's specialized for education lending in India. Meanwhile, we're also using the MFIs as our boots on the ground to keep our operational costs low while maintaining the rigor that's required to protect, protect your returns. So speaking of those returns, I'm going to turn it over to Erica to talk a little bit more how we're going to deliver them to you. So uh, for the investors, uh, we are going to create value uh, not only with uh, financial returns, but also by helping these investors are going to help us to create a social impact. Uh, but, uh, for the low-fee low private schools, we are going to help them to create 8,000 new seats, and also to, uh, 250 new schools will, get, will be registered uh, over the, the period of the fund. And these students and parents will also be benefited because we are going to help uh, to prevent 80,000 uh, dropouts from the students. And our, our partner MFIs, we are going to uh, help them to have additional 300,000 income per year. And also, uh, they are gonna have access to 200,000 uh, new potential uh, clients. Uh, the financial returns for the investors, you can clearly see that they, the investors are gonna receive after year five because we have the fund set up and we need time for the schools to expand. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, the return is, gonna, is expected to be 7%. 7% net of fees and already in real returns because it's inflation hedged and this will provide an alpha of two compared uh, to the benchmarks that benchmark funds that we we, we found in India. Uh, talking about a little talking a little bit about the the our roadmap to implement we expect to take up to one year to uh, to the fund setup, uh, to uh, fill the legal requirements to start a company in India, build a team uh, there, and also uh, to raise funds with investors. After that, we start uh, the investments with the schools, and by the end of the second year, we expect to have uh, 360 schools in our portfolio. Uh, we need to think about scale as well. So this uh, first fund will have uh, 1,000 schools in Uttar Pradesh. And then uh, the rollout, the, the subsequent funds will be, uh, we plan to have to be in India, in other states, and then in other uh, emerging market countries that face the same problem uh, in, in, the, in the education space. The investors are also uh, 
we start with impact investors and then we move uh, to family offices as well because we need uh, more funds. You can see that the social impact is gonna be uh, very big and it, it scales over time. So this is, we believe, is the right thing to deliver. Uh, we are passionate about education. We have experience in finance and entrepreneurship. And we plan to have other key hirings. One person who can navigate the education space in India, and another uh, person who, can, who understands the regulatory environment in the country. And uh, together, we, we are going to implement this innovative solution and help to foster education in India and in other emerging market countries. Thank you. Let me uh, maybe get some of the questions started. And um, each of you have had startup experience. And so you've built companies, companies that have products and widgets, uh, uh, some of it very related to education. When you came up with this idea, why did you decide to create a financial instrument, uh, a fund, uh, uh, rather than uh, a product or a services company or start a chain of schools, for example? Why use a fund mechanism? Okay. Um, go. You want to go for it? Go for it. I would say, yeah, as you mentioned, all of us have entrepreneurship experience. Uh, we started with the problem. Uh, you know, we knew we wanted something in India, and perhaps Ashwin is, is better to speak to this, but we have a, you know, we had a connection to, uh, to the area and knew that this was a huge problem. The way to solve this problem is with a financial mechanism. Um, and so at the end of the day, all of us know how to build a product for a real need, um, for real customers. The, the, you know, the, the tools you use are different. Um, you know, we certainly aren't talking about you know, currency risk when we're talking about our, our tech startups. But at the end of the day, we're still, we know that they're LPs. These are going to be our customers, and we can solve a real need using the same uh, skills that we've developed in our more technical entrepreneurship. Just to, just to build on that a little bit, I think what Chris said is, is correct because the problem that we saw here wasn't that there was a lack of expertise or a lack of a product or a service. There are schools doing a great job right now providing decent quality education to kids in India for a very low cost. And they're the experts in that space. What we really wanted to do was to give them a little bit more leverage, a little bit more opportunity to grow and to expand. And I think that is best achieved through finance, and that best fits um, our skill set, I think, in the education part. That's you. We'll pick the good schools. We'll pick the best schools. You guys know how to do your stuff. Here's some money. Go and build out. Go and teach more kids than you can normally. So I think it is a good tool to solve the problem that we saw. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, of Michael Milken's uh, uh, speech yesterday at lunch about uh, one of the great uh, tools that we can provide society is access to capital. And so you're trying to drive access to capital as the, as the driver of change as opposed to the entrepreneurship of creating new schools. And you're saying there's plenty of those. And, 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 and now let's solve the, the, the access to capital issue, the access to scaling. Let me open it up to a few questions in, in the audience. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, very impressive. Uh, and then one question is that uh, very key to for the schools to have uh, stable revenue, which we, they can share with you, is the quality of the school. Do you have any uh, say or intervention to ensure that they will the school will maintain quality and then will continue to attract students as source of revenue? Are you for investment Sorry. criteria? Yeah. So, uh, can you just repeat the question? I'm not sure if I, if I got it. Yes. My question is that how do you ensure that the schools will continue to maintain quality education so okay. that they will be able to uh, continuously attract students? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, so first, it's the point that the schools that we are going to choose, because we, the, these schools need to fill uh, some criteria, minimum number of students, a minimum operating margin, uh, the, a minimum quality that we, we can do some uh, interviews with people and some tests that the students can, can make. 
so it's the first point is to be sure that these schools fill this criteria, and then we can track this over time. Um, yeah, also, you? to build to build a little bit on that, I think there is. Um, definitely the due diligence process is going to be very critical because we will have a man on the ground who does interviews for a week and gets a sense from the locals as well about whether or not the school is providing a good education. Uh, but after they are part of our network, I think there's two other things that become quite important. Um, first of all, we will try to leverage as best as possible our own internal network because we have, at least at some point, we will have some scale and have some good schools within that space to actually share and collaborate across best practices and things like that. Um, and the second thing is that we do, we will keep track of tests and test scores of these schools. And while it's not really um, tied to any payments right now, that could be a possibility in the future where, all right, if you perform better on your tests, you know, you can maybe pay us a little bit less. The reason that we haven't gone into that area is just because there isn't a standardized test at the grade one to five level that is uniform enough for us to do that. But at some point across all of our schools, that could be something that we do. One of the things that, that I think has been most impressive is that, uh, as you might imagine, this, this started as a student competition, grad school, uh, school competition. But if I look out over the last few years, 2016's team, uh, Terra Limpa, which had a, uh, a, a, in effect, a real estate development fund idea to address uh, mine fields uh, and mine ridden uh, lands, farmlands in, uh, in Angola and a capital markets model on how to not only clear the mines, but then create land value from that for small stakeholder farmers. In 2015, uh, and they're, 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 they're doing it. They're out in Angola at this point, uh, having graduated, uh, really trying to make this fund happen. 2015's winner uh, was Blue Forest. And uh, Blue Forest had come up with a very, very innovative environmental bond that linked uh, clearing of uh, forests, in especially the Sierra Nevadas in the United States, uh, that are very fire, uh, forest fire ridden at this point, and linked it to actually uh, water uh, and water retention, and therefore uh, linked the water utilities in with, um, with forest fires and created an environmental bond that they're actually launching the, uh, the first version of that in California. 2014's winner was Fresh Coast. And, uh, and Fresh Coast uh, created a very innovative uh, land structure, land use structure fund uh, that addressed the uh, literally um, square miles worth of northern U.S. cities like Detroit, Cleveland, uh, uh, Peoria, where the lands have largely gone abandoned and are no longer in use and no longer productive, and how to bring that back to productive, potentially non-residential use. And, and the, so the question I have for you is, um, was this just a class project uh, and a competition, or do you have intentions on, on making this happen? And if you do, what are you going to need in order to get this to, to, to see the light of day? Thank you. So we are all very passionate about this idea, and we all think that it has um, great potential on the ground. So we are keen to see it through. Now, in terms of timeline, um, I have another year left in business school, and we plan to spend that time validating the idea a little more, doing a couple of trips to India, finding schools, finding partners, and things like that. Um, that will take maybe $50,000 just to do a little bit of ground research. Once I graduate in 2018 of June, uh, the plan is to actually kick this off. If everything goes well during the validation phase, the plan is to actually kick this off um, full swing. We, as Erica mentioned, we do have a year of startup time where we need to raise funds, um, do all of the setup and things like that. And we estimate the amount of money that we'll need. Of course, that estimate will change over time, but we're currently estimating $500,000 uh, that we'll need for the initial setup to actually start this off. That will bring us up till about year three when we'll start getting money back from the schools that we have um, invested in and we'll be self-sustaining from that point onwards. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm the Consul General of Angola here in Los Angeles. Um, I was talking about the Angola 
the program we made in Angola. I don't know. I, 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 I was not aware about it. Uh, my question is, uh, today, you know, uh, English is a, a language where we can communicate for everyone in the world. And Angola don't speak English. Uh, our uh, um, national language or official language is Portuguese. I have interesting to maybe I don't know to have to request to address this uh, this, uh, this this uh, this this uh, this this question to see how we can improve more about Angola concerning about education uh, school in uh, language as maybe in the second language school is this any fund and how can work with you to see how can uh, uh, develop this area. Um, so actually, on that point of English as a medium, one of the main allures of these low-fee private schools is that they are predominantly English medium. Um, a lot of the public schools are run by states, um, and they tend to be in the medium of whatever state language that happens to be Telugu, Kannada, etc. But these low-fee private schools tend to all be English medium schools. Um, and that's the reason parents are willing to pay that extra $7 a month instead of uh, you know, sending them to a free school. And for some reason, the states are still stuck and can't move past the fact that, all right, I want to teach in um, whatever my state language is. But these private institutions can. They, I'm not sure what the regulatory framework in Angola is around setting up a low-fee private school. but. Uh, at least I think that in India, this is really helping a lot, especially the low-income uh, bracket of society. They have access to these schools, not much cost. Their kid can grow up with English as effectively their first language because they learn everything in English. And that makes them so much more uh, employable in the future. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure if that completely addresses your, your question, but um, that's what's happening in India as a trend. And this came up just because of consumer demand. It wasn't because the government did something or anything like that. Just because people wanted their kids to learn English and be taught in an English medium, these schools said, okay, yeah, I can teach in an English medium format. And it just went from there. So. But I think the idea of using a special th specialty debt instrument to address the, uh, s the uh, supply capital to, uh, to, to fund schools Perhaps as a as a scalable model that 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 uh, doesn't just apply to how you've applied it here to Indian uh, based schools, yep. that it potentially has a, an applicability much broader. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, I just had a question in terms of scale. I mean, it seems like a lot of this hinges on the uh, school's uh, willingness to take that twenty five percent in lieu of nothing, and given the um, uh, fact that it's better than nothing, and uh, I just have a question with respect to like the attrition rates um, across schools. Like, how uniform is that in terms of like what are you anticipating? Some of the challenges that would come along with as you look to scale this beyond whatever initial grouping scope that you that you looked at at that level, especially as you look at this larger market of three point three point five billion dollars, right? I mean, but you can't look at all the schools within there. So I'm I'm just wondering about like how you're anticipating something like that. Um, so, it, in terms of, okay, so there's the attrition rate aspect and uh, the scalability side, which are obviously interrelated. Um, in terms of attrition rate, actually, we're anticipating in our models um, roughly a 10% default rate every year for these schools. This actually is uh, m more than double of what the other lenders in the space currently face. ISFC and Varadhana face about a 5% rate of missed um, payments. We're anticipating something like a 10% rate because of we're serving a set of schools who are more volatile, who have more volatile revenues and things like that. Um, so that's something that, to be honest, we need to test in the first year um, and actually see whether or not this model can achieve those rates. Or if the rates go beyond 15%, then it's something that actually is a problem for our model. But hopefully, that doesn't happen. Um, on the scalability side of things, and I'm sure Chris and Erica can, can add on um, on this piece, there are a lot of, we're trying our best to minimize the amount of work that we need to do internally and giving a lot of that to the MFIs. 
uh, as boots on the ground to run, do uh, fact checking for us, do some collections for us, and also provide all of these student loans for us, because that's a very, very labor intensive piece that's going to limit how much and how fast we can scale. And that actually brings me back to the point of um, attrition, because as we scale and as we go beyond and outside a state in India to five or six states, there is also some diversification benefit to that. And hopefully that will bring down the risk of default or a risk of something like a, a black swan probably doesn't apply in this case, but black swan for our particular company um, happening to us. Yeah, I don't know just if uh, to add on the scale point, if you think like India have a lot of different, very different states where the regulations are very different as well. So that's something that we need to consider when expanding. Uh, also the, uh, the profile of the schools as well, if you think about rural or urban, or urban schools, they, are, they face very different problems uh, on the ground. And that's something that we foresee as well. To the direct, sorry, to the direct mechanism on the 25% kind of coverage, uh, that was something we've talked with a number of these low-fee private schools in India, in, in India, um, and they've said that yeah, this is a, this would be beneficial. Like this would be something I would, I would do for. So then we can extrapolate from there and test and see what that actual attrition rate ends up looking like. Hi. I'm just uh, wondering how it was that you decided on the K-12 education space as opposed to, say, institutions that offer an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree or something like that. Just because it seems to me like, for example, an associate's degree, you're talking about a very short turnaround time from person entering school to then having a skill and being a productive member of society. As opposed to K-12, you're talking about a very long time horizon, obviously. So, and, and then also, I would imagine that at that level, the standards are probably more standardized across the board than they would be varying region to region as they would with K-12. So how was it that you kind of like took a look at overall and decided K-12 to is the area we want to focus on? Yeah, uh, today in India you have uh, se several, a lot of uh, solutions to the um, college levels, uh, much more than you have for K-12. And also uh, for us, like if you impact K-12, it's much more, your impact is much bigger in a country like India where you need, you have a lot of uh, illiteracy. Uh, so we, we thought it was a better approach and you would create more impact by targeting this population when you, that they need more and they, there's no, there, there are not a lot of solutions in this space today. I think it also speaks to the power of debt and debt as a much more ubiquitous instrument than potentially equity. And so the, you've literally got tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of potential schools. And the whole K through 12, it, it's a debt instrument. And the ongoing uh, expansion of these schools means that you actually have a broad customer base and the broad opportunity to make an impact. And really, the, the, the key issue that you're, 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 because it's a debt instrument, the key issue that you're dealing with is, will I get paid back? All right, not necessarily multiples on capital in terms of equity. And so I, I think these are, these are very much you know, issues of how do I want to broaden my maximum amount of impact on a society, and, mm -hmm. and debt's oftentimes overlooked. Um, just to actually, um, just to build on that point a little bit, the other thing about it is that these low-fee private schools are actually very good businesses. If you look at some of the tier one schools, the larger ones, they're getting net margins of something like 20 to 25 percent. Um, and that's still at charging seven US dollars per month per student, which is still very reachable to the lower income bracket in India. Um, the thing that they really lack is visibility. You know, visibility and people willing to trust them and give them a shot, give them money. So I think that's what we also found that, yep, definitely, I fully agree with your point that K-12 turnaround is so much harder, but I think parents now in India are beginning to realize the value of education, at least in the urban area where they see so many people going into the IT space and okay, why can't my kid do that? And these schools are an answer to that and we need to recognize these schools and trust them and give them money and they're actually pretty good businesses. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Thank you. I forgot to mention, uh, I'm, I'm from Indonesia, I'm with Tanato Foundation, yeah? so, but 
at the beginning of the process, as you mentioned, it's uh, the 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 loan is to finance expansion, <laughs> meaning additional building, additional classrooms. Yeah, but will it apply to situations mm. where it's not for building more classrooms, but for other things that would probably enable or justify the schools to increase revenue uh, to increase the the tuition fees, for instance. Like, right. uh, how is that? I mean, is it strictly for co construction of more classroom and maybe related to that is the hiring of more teachers right mm. yeah so or is it open also for uh, application for other methods like teachers training improvement of equipment infrastructure thank you mm. got it perfect um Sorry? okay sure <laughs> um actually that's a very very good point because a lot of schools that we talked to one of the schools he wanted to do an expansion, build an entire second floor of his school, not for extra classrooms, but to just build a library so that his kids can actually get access to books that they've never read before and actually learn a lot more things. Um, now, it's, a little, it's just a little bit more difficult to build a business case for that. That's why, at least in our presentation, we've stuck to expansion. And there's also unregistered schools, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and to be very honest, we do want to try to support this, um, but we'll have to do a bit more research on that to figure out, okay, how can you actually build a business case for these schools to build a library? Because none of these principals that we talk to actually want to charge more money to the kids. That's against the point of these schools in the first place. And if you can't charge more money to the kids and you're not growing more kids, how do you actually get that money back? So I, it's something that we want to do. Um, I, I don't really know how to do it. Now, on the registration point, there, are, uh, there is a school registration process, and I'm sure there's a very similar one in Indonesia. The school registration process in India is quite difficult. There are certain requirements around having particular um, infrastructure, like kitchens, like having a playground on your school premises and things like that. Now, a lot of schools, the founders don't really have enough money to build out these facilities, and what they do is, forget it, let me just run a school, you can send your kid here, I'll teach you, maybe I'll pay a bribe to the local official to make sure that you get a transfer certificate. These schools, we plan to provide funding to them as well. Right now, nobody is looking at these schools because they're completely unregistered and they say the risk is too high. We want to try to serve them and say, okay, look, if you're missing a playground, we'll give you a bit of a loan, go and build a playground, get registered. That way you can stop pr paying bribes to the local official you have more stable revenues because there's less risk of you closing and parents are going to trust you more so they're going to be more willing to send their kids to your school and you probably get a full classroom instead of maybe a half empty classroom so that's one aspect where we're not focusing purely on the expansion side of things so a little bit on the quality side but more from ensuring that they get legally registered so that they can provide a better service to these kids just uh, to add, um, many students today, they drop out school because they are not interested at all. So if you have a library or any mm. other thing yeah. that it's interesting, it can help them to not drop out. That's our thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I, I think one of the things that, that, that just bears highlighting here is that we, uh, in the last few years, we've, we've had a, uh, a, a tremendous amount of, of interest and activity in social enterprise and in products and services to address both environmental as well as uh, developing country, uh, access to energy, access to clean water. And, and one of the observations that you'd make is that, that, that almost always after you have the product, you have to deal with them with how do you finance it? And how do you finance it to scale? And so I, I think one of the most exciting things about the sustainable investing challenge is the recognition that finance itself plays a role as a innovation in and of itself. And, and we have a long history of that. Um, uh, we oftentimes forget that things like the 30-year uh, the fully amortized mortgage uh, is a financial innovation that was to foster a social policy. Home ownership is a good thing. Now how do I finance that? And how do I finance that in a mainstream way? And so this idea that finance is a, is a, uh, is a, is a part of the change and an innovation in and of itself is, is part of what led to the creation of the innovation challenge, uh, the, 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 the sustainable uh, investing challenge. I, I think the other thing that we had as an objective was that this was not uh, something that uh, was the 
domain of just the best business schools or the most well-known business schools, the, the Harvard, Stanford, Kellogg's, Whartons, NCIDs uh, of the world. And, and, and I will tell you a, a little story. I think one of the proudest things that, that happened in 2016 when we ran the competition in Hong Kong was that one of the 10 finalists was a, uh, a university, an agricultural university uh, from Indonesia. And, and you can find them on the website if you click through. And, uh, and, uh, and these uh, three or four students, uh, they're actually highlighted in a Morgan Stanley video, uh, 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 came up with an idea, a financial instrument, and, uh, and they found themselves on the stage with students from arguably the top business schools of the world. And so, so we, we, are, we are catalyzing and finding this source of financial innovation uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, in almost every single university, every single student population. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to foster that innovation. A any other questions? L let me ask you uh, along those lines. And um, what do you think is motivating, or is there a motivation in and, and, a, and a different attitude in the business uh, school students, the graduate students that are your peers? Uh, and, and how are they different? How do they think about this? Is, are, are you an exception? Or do you find that kind of thinking and that kind of objective uh, in the business schools? And how are the business school curriculums at places like Kellogg shaping themselves to meet your needs? Well, um, I, actually, I think, OK. This is a bit of a question of the kinds of circles that you do hang around with. But my general sense, uh, having a sister who went to business school eight years ago, I do feel that it is changing. I think the demand of our generation in particular is becoming a little bit more about, OK, fine, I know that I can invest. I know that I can get these returns. But what, is, what are my dollars actually going to do? That focus on impact, maybe not impact investing, but at least directed investing to say that, OK, my dollars are going to go to improve this particular thing. I think I've heard that sentiment a lot from a lot of my friends. And a lot of people do want to enter into this space. There are so many social entrepreneurs right now at business school. There are so many people keen to get into social impact, keen to get into impact investing, and all such things. And um, at least what I've seen at Kellogg, they have catered themselves to that demand. There are a lot of classes that we can take that are around impact investing, social entrepreneurship, et cetera. And many more clubs and activities that you can do, like this Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investing Challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I, if you ask me, yes, I do feel like there is a bit of a mindset shift in, the, in this generation um, where the focus is a bit more on the impact side of things rather than the dollar returns. But, I'm, as, the, as the resident two year or second year, uh, I will say what's been most interesting, especially with, for instance, the SIC, um, is you know one of my selection criteria when going into uh, business school was you know what is the what is the attitude, the temperature around um, social impact. Uh, that was something I was looking for, and that was why that was really the, the tipping point for why Kellogg you know won out at the schools that I, I looked at. Um, so going in then, kind of in my first year, it my assumption was that this was as good as it gets as far as that's concerned. So it just you, when you go to the SIC and you see that you know, there's a team from Stanford and you see there's a, that there's a team from Indonesia, you realize that, no, actually, this is, a, this is kind of a, a widespread global movement. And there are other people that also have these values um, out of my generation. So that has been interesting to watch. And it's been a, it's been a mindset shift from day one and first year to you know, last day, second year. Yeah. Also, uh, I see that there are the two sides. Like the students are more interested in they are going to these MBA schools to have opportunity and access to this uh, new trends in social impact investing and this kind of stuff. And also, the MBA schools are also offering this to these students. So we have both sides. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited in that. Um you know, our day job, my day job at Equilibrium is running a firm that uh, focuses in on uh, building uh, investment strategies for institutional investors uh, based on sustainability themes and sustainability trends and sustainability advantages. 
And, and the observation we would make is that we've gone from eight, nine years ago, a very fringe discussion, to now this issue of sustainability and impact as a core part of a portfolio is now a mainstream discussion topic, whether it's couched in the phrases of the risk uh, of natural resources or the opportunities in natural resources and of sustainability. Uh, but this is now a frame that, uh, that you find through more and more pension plans and, and sovereign wealth funds, as well as uh, endowments. And so I think we're looking now as a, as a sector, as an investment sector, uh, to, uh, to graduate students, graduates that, that are potentially new hires, that bring that thinking that, uh, that's now very much increasingly part of the mainstream discussion. And, and you can see this happening at BlackRock, you can see this happening at, at Goldman Sachs, you can see this happening at, at major, major institutions. And, uh, and so it's not just, I think, um, students wanting to, to, um, to express their values. It's now the investment firms and employers increasingly feeling that there's a need for that kind of of uh, training and expertise within their within their workforce and their next generation of investment professionals. Uh, if one more question, and sorry, <coughs> sorry, I just had a kind of a really specific question that's a follow-on of what we we're just talking about. Um, I went to business school a few years ago, about four years ago at Wharton, and there wasn't very much support as far as in social impact. It's gotten, it's getting better, um, but you find a lot of the support is when I talk about support and mentorship is around driving talent towards impact investing and not so much entrepreneurship. And I fear that's creating a, a, um, a market where there's far more people doing impact investing and not much talent in the actual entrepreneurship, which of course is gonna stop the growth of the actual sector. How do we, were you, two, well, one question really, were you able to find mentors in school and professors and such, or how do we inspire uh, such talent at these top MBA schools to go and actually solve, I mean, go into the entrepreneurship side of the problem? Yeah, just uh, first, one of the reasons that I chose Kellogg, it's because I'm an entrepreneur, and Kellogg offers a lot of courses in entrepreneurship, several pathways that you, that you can do. Uh, that was the main reason uh, why I chose uh, this school. Uh, and so what was the follow -up? Mentors? Okay. Uh, the mentors. Oh, yeah. Do you wanna? Okay. Uh, so what I, yeah, uh, to the question on mentors, um, I, I will say definitely there have been fantastic mentors, and actually, not just for their expertise in MFIs or whatever it might be in the space, but more for their uh, networks and contact networks. The, as part of this project we managed to speak with the CEO of ISFC, one of the other lenders. We spoke with the CEO of Vardhana. Uh, we spoke with quite a lot of other, um, we spoke with a couple of people in at the MFI space and things like that. And all of that really helped us build out a business plan which makes sense, you know, sort of at least it tied in with what people were feeling on the ground and what the sentiment was. Because none of this is available online. You can't type in a Google search and find it. You have to talk to people. And really, if we weren't speaking with these professors and getting uh, connected through them, I don't think we would have gotten as far as, as we did. So yeah, I think, you know, at least now there is some scope. You have to reach out and you have to try. We were part of this competition, so we were really pushing and trying to find these professors and asking them, hey, can you connect us here? Can you connect us there? And things like that. Um, but, but yeah, I think so. Yes, I think Dave actually touched on this just slightly, which is, if you, I, I think if you asked our student body, all of our peers, they would say there's not enough employers, impact investing employers, that are coming to campus. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that there's that demand argument is still to be made. You know, change, uh, change has this funny cycle where it uh, dwells for a long time, and then it does hit these inflection points. And, and, and it's funny, at, at Wharton, uh, I would say that the center of gravity there is both your, uh, at Wharton, you run now an entrepreneurship competition, uh, a social entrepreneurship competition. Uh, it's become quite well known. But you also have Professor David Musto 
uh, that's, uh, that's your chair of your finance department that is now really carrying the banner about these issues of, of impact. He's done a lot of writing on benefit corporations. Uh, and so these, these various aspects are, are, are coming about. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, Getzny's uh, class is now, I think, up to three sections of 60. It, it may be four sections of 60 at Wharton. Uh, and he's teaching impact investing. And, and so these things have a funny way of inflecting and then all of a sudden taking off. And, uh, and we're finding that Wharton experience being shared across at major institutions uh, 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 around the world. In, in fact, uh, in June, one of the things that we're going to try to do, that we've planned to do, is to convene a group of about 25 leading educators from the top schools uh, around the world that are teaching various aspects of impact investing or sustainable finance. Uh, the use of market mechanisms to, uh, to create positive outcomes in markets um, uh, uh, at Kellogg and, and begin the discussion of common frameworks, cases, uh, curriculum, how are we teaching students, our approach, and to begin that whole sharing and, uh, of, of, of the teaching process itself as well as key aspects of research in, in, in this topic area. So it's, it, 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 could this have been done four or five years ago? No. But, but, but now feels like the right time to do it and the enthusiasm there. And a large part of it is driven by student attention, but it's now increasingly uh, spreading into the core academic uh, staff as well as into the administrations. So there, there is a bit of change taking place. So it's, it's, there's some optimism here. With that, I'm going to end the session with just one uh, last note, and that is uh, thanks to, to the team here for presenting and being such a great case example, and congratulations for winning the 2017 uh, Kellogg Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investing Challenge. Uh, I just want to highlight for everyone that, that uh, as much as we're ecstatic that, 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 that we were able to have the winners here, they were one of 10 and literally one of tens a hundred plans that were submitted from around the world and, and really it is it's the tip of the iceberg of a, of a, of a, of a of what I think is a movement and uh, and we're also very very grateful to the uh, Milken Institute and the Milken Global Conference they've been a great sponsor for this activity it, it fits in ideally with their bringing of markets and uh, capital and investments uh, to make changes in our world and so we're very grateful that they've been a sponsor from day one of the SIC. With that, thank you, and uh, I'll invite you to, 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 to speak to the students afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.